The payoff for me filling up the outside of our house with snotty cars is that the missus gets to choose her own car. She only wants the one, but she wants it to be a nice one. So I can't really argue with that if she's only having the one. Now before the hashtag me too bloggers start to rip me apart, it's not that I control her decisions, far from it. In fact, quite the opposite. It's just that she has really bad taste in cars. It's not that she'll go out and buy a Renault or a Vauxhall or anything like that. It's worse. She likes expensive crap cars. The ones that cost a fortune to keep on the road. It's a really bad combination. Now, part of the reason is that she's half Russian, and we all know that Russians like a bit of bling. They love their expensive brands. You like my new Prada underpants, yes? Good. Okay, now I kill you. Now, luckily for me, she only likes SUVs or 4x4s or whatever you want to call them. Which is great for me, because it gets me off the hook for having the family car, which leads me to buy all the stupid impractical cars. Now, as much as I don't like SUVs, they do make pretty good family cars. So, as in the title, the budget is £10,000. Don't crash into me, you bastard. Now, the problem with her being Russian and only liking SUVs is that left to her own devices, she'll go out and buy £10,000 worth of Range Rover. She's done it twice before, and they were awful. They kept breaking and falling apart in all the ways that Range Rovers do. And you never quite knew if you were going to get where you were going, or if you'd end up with a £3,000 bill. It felt like I was always being mugged, and the credit card was then maxed out every couple of months. Never, ever again. For those of you that think I'm scaremongering about Range Rovers, a pal of mine used to have a small car dealership, and they would sell warranties from a warranty company, and the warranty was the same price whatever car you had. It didn't matter if it was a Citroen or a Mercedes, except for Range Rovers. They had a 50% loading. Range Rovers cost the warranty company so much more money, they had to charge 50% more just to cover their bottoms. So I had to find something with a bit of brand cachet, something that will keep the complaining to a minimum, something that wouldn't look out of place outside a Russian Mafia nightclub. But unlike a Range Rover, won't break down or shake me upside down until my money falls out. She didn't want anything from Skoda or Nissan or Toyota or Honda or Volkswagen. You get the idea. If it hasn't got the brand image, doesn't matter how good the car is, she's not interested. So that leaves me with the BMWs and the Audis, Mercedes and Lexus of the world. But of course, she doesn't like those either. Don't ask me why. It's woman logic. Only they understand it. It has to be a Range Rover. Plenty room for Kalashnikov in boot. It wasn't going so well. But there is a better alternative than all of those for the price bracket. Now, she may only care about brand appeal, but I care about reliability. If we break down somewhere with the kids in the car, in the cold and the dark, in the middle of nowhere, guess who's going to be looking at a long stretch in the marital gulag? Yeah, this guy! Now, it's no secret that I have a very soft spot for Porsches. When I was a young teenager, I used to hide a copy of the Porsche brochure inside the lady magazine, just so in case my parents walked in, they would think I was doing normal teenager stuff. It's a joke. Thanks to Porsche, there's an alternative. If I can find one of their SUVs for under £10,000, that's the bad boy right there. Porsche beats Range Rover in a fist fight all day long, right? Wrong. It's OK, but the Range Rover's still better. But Range Rovers break all the time. Don't care. Looks good. <laughs> I've got to admit, she doesn't actually sound like that. When this video comes out, I'm in so much trouble. I'm going to get ground up into fat man caviar. I wouldn't feed this caviar to dog. I can't stop. I gotta stop. I gotta stop. Now, when the KM was launched in 2003, I didn't like it. To me, it wasn't a Porsche. It was a bloody SUV 4x4 thing. It's not a Porsche. It was neither one thing nor the other. It looked awkward. All right, pig ugly. It looked like something that had been dragged up from the bottom of the ocean that had never seen daylight before. Or a frog. I didn't like the change from sports car manufacturer to SUV manufacturer. To me, again, it devalued the brand. But I have to admit I was wrong, because it went on to become Porsche's bestseller. So what do I know? In 2007, they made some small changes to the lights and other bits and pieces. Only small changes, but really effective. I think they transformed it. For me, it competes with a Range Rover on image. It looks classy and expensive. And like them or not, Porsche have got massive brand appeal. So, what are you driving nowadays? Porsche Cayenne. Ooh, you've made it. Mm, no, I bought it. So we bought this one. Well, we haven't just bought it. We bought it about 18 months ago. It's done holidays and carried bikes and junk and school runs. It's been well and truly tested. It's a 2009 three-litre diesel. 
I paid £10,500 for it 18 months ago. It had 100,000 miles on it with a full non-main dealer specialist service history. It's now done 112,000 miles and it's probably worth about 9500 and I would absolutely pay that for it today. But why did you buy the diesel model? It's not very Porsche, is it? Well, a couple of reasons, really. The first is, the wife isn't much of a driving fanatic. I don't really think she can tell the difference between a diesel and a petrol car. And while she doesn't care about speed, she does care about fuel economy. I mean, she's still annoyed after she found out that you don't just fill it up once for the rest of your life. Now, I read a lot of reviews that tell you that the 3.6 petrol is almost as economical as a 3 litre diesel, so you may as well go for the petrol. Say what? But I don't know what they were smoking, because they're not similar at all. I borrowed a 3.6 petrol for a week or so, and I tell you, it's nothing the same. We get about 28 to 32 miles per gallon out of this one. I got about 23 out of the 3.6 petrol. Secondly, it uses Audi Volkswagen's tried and tested 3 litre diesel engine. It's tried and tested throughout the range. It's pretty refined, it's pretty powerful, and it kicks out 240 horsepowers and 550 minimums of torques. Being a VAG unit, it's cheaper to maintain and service as well. Yes, it's true, the KN does share some bits and pieces with the Touareg, but only where it's beneficial to you. The brakes, the engine, and some switchgear and other bits and pieces can all be bought from Volkswagen Audi, which saves you money because you don't have to go to the Porsche dealer and pay Porsche prices and Porsche labour costs. On the road, the KN handles brilliantly. It corners flat and will outhandle most other SUVs. You can throw it into corners that you can only throw a Ranger over into if you'd remember to wear your brown underpants. And all KNs are quick. Even this diesel version's quick. It does 0 to 60 in 8 seconds. Now that doesn't sound a lot by today's standards, even for some SUVs. But think about this. The Peugeot 205 GTI, an iconic 80s hot hatchback, did 0 to 60 in 8.7 seconds. Yeah! slower and that was made of tissue and feathers so is it any good off-road let's find out it's really rather good joking aside though even though that's as much off-road as most KNs will ever see the KN is brilliant off-road <laughs> can really hold its own with the big boys. Air suspension gives it 10.7 inches of ground clearance and it has a very clever four-wheel drive system. Even though it uses open diffs which would normally send all the power to the slipping wheel, it uses a very clever traction management system which will redirect power and uses the brakes to control each wheel. It's so versatile it can even send all the power to just one wheel if necessary. This generation of KN even has a low ratio transfer box and a reinforced underbody. I mean, that's proper off-roady stuff. Now, I know most of this will never get used on the average school run unless your school run is over a mountain, but it's great to know how capable it is. Well done, Porsche. But where it counts, Porsche have punched the Touareg straight in the face. Porsche weren't lazy with the interior. They've used all their own dials, instruments, and switch gear, and it's just a nicer place to be. It also gets nicer seats and a leather-lined dashboard, which gives it some real class. It feels like an event when you climb inside. And it's really nice to have a Porsche logo staring back at you from a 911-style steering wheel. This one's got sat-nav, heated seats, parking centres, and pretty much everything else you'd want. The only thing missing for me, and I really miss it, is cruise control. Now I can tell you in 18 months, it's never let us down. It's had some routine servicing, it's had a new set of brake pads, and that's it. It's been utterly, utterly reliable. Now that's why I think the Porsche Cayenne is the best SUV under £10,000. It does everything brilliantly, and it still looks up market. Now let me know in the comments below if you agree or not. And maybe leave a thumbs up if you like the videos. And if you haven't subscribed already, click subscribe. Or I'll send KGB around. Oh, I'm in so much trouble when this comes out. Mm -hmm.